much. Uh, Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Madam Minister, for being here and for uh, your presentation. Uh, before I uh, ask some questions about uh, the process that your government has unveiled with respect to Supreme Court uh, appointments, I do have one uh, question that I do want to ask uh, in light of the comments that were made by uh, Chief Justice McLaughlin as reported in the Ottawa Citizen about the fact that we have uh, in Canada 44 uh, judicial vacancies and the negative impact that this is having on the administration of justice uh, across Canada. Uh, Whether you have uh, appointed as of today a judicial affairs advisor. Well, I question maybe slightly out of the scope of the nature of the presentation of the minister. So I, I'm, I'm just wondering, Mr. Cooper, is that the only question that you're going to have that's going to go outside the scope? That, that's correct. Okay, so Madam Minister, it's up to you if you want to respond. Oh, I'm happy to, to respond to the question and certainly thank uh, uh, Mr. Cooper for the question and his diligence in terms of uh, raising the issue of judicial appointments on an ongoing basis. Uh, as I've indicated uh, previously and, and will continue to do so, uh, we have made, as you point out, uh, appointments, uh, recognize um, the uh, vacancies that exist and are working diligently to fill those vacancies based on a new process, much the same as what has been articulated here in terms of the Supreme Court, um, a process that will embrace uh, uh, diversity and, and again will be uh, um, uh, to ensure that uh, the justices reflect the diversity of the country. Uh, in terms of your specific question on a judicial affairs advisor, um, we uh, in my office are uh, supported by a significant number of individuals that have assisted in uh, the previous appointments. Uh, it is my intention to uh, have a judicial affairs advisor in place in due course. Uh, thank you, Madam Minister, for that answer. Uh, now turning to, to the substance of, of why you are here today uh, in terms of the process that you, uh, your government has unveiled, I have to admit I have some concerns uh, with it. Uh, one of the uh, concerns that I have uh, is, is with respect to the fact that the process does not respect the long-standing constitutional convention of ensuring that Atlanta, Canada have at least one seat on uh, the Supreme Court, a convention that dates back uh, more than a hundred years. And I was wondering if you might be able to comment on what authority the executive has to unilaterally overturn a constitutional convention, a constitutional convention, the effect of which will change the composition of the court unilaterally without the consent of parliament and without the consent of the provinces as provided for in section 41 sub D of the Constitution Act of 1982. Well, thank you for, for the, the question and uh, again, uh, focusing on, on regional representation, I will underscore that regional representation is an important consideration criteria for um, this process and um, we uh, recognize, as I said earlier, that um, this appointment process does not preclude an appointment from Atlantic Canada and that the Prime Minister has, uh, based on the policies and the approach to ensure that other criteria like diversity, like ensuring that we have um, a deep pool of qualified jurists uh, in terms that would uh, provide uh, um, a deep pool of qualified jurists to the advisory board for their consideration is available. That is not to say that regional representation is not important um, and uh, recognize that there will be candidates from the Atlantic on the short list that is provided to the yeah. Prime Minister. Well, well, thank you, Minister, and I, I certainly uh, agree that it's uh, diversity and all of those things are, are important. And I also acknowledge that you said uh, that Atlantic Canada would not necessarily be precluded but you've also, in so saying that, that uh, you, the government may appoint someone 
other than uh, an Atlantic Canadian, and I want to get back to the question of what authority the executive of the government has to do that unilaterally. And to that end, I would just draw your attention to paragraph 74 of the Nadon uh, decision, and I'll just read it. It says, quote, uh, Parliament cannot unilaterally change the, so in this case it's not even Parliament, it's the executive, unilaterally change the composition of the Supreme Court of Canada. Essential features of the court are constitutionally protected under Part 5 of the Constitution Act 1982. Changes to the composition of the court can only be made under the procedure provided in Section 41, uh, which again requires uh, consent of Parliament and the consent of all ten provinces. So uh, I, I guess I'd like uh, perhaps if you could perhaps clarify in light of that, in light of the clear pronouncement of the Supreme Court in that dawn, what authority the executive has to unilaterally overturn this constitutional convention related to the composition of the court. Well, I appreciate you reading out that excerpt from the Nadon decision and recognize that uh, the amending formula to change the composition of the Supreme Court of Canada is unilateral. Uh, in terms of regional representation, again, I will underscore that um, we are not precluding having an Atlantic candidate as the next Supreme Court of Canada uh, justice. Um, it is um, not without precedent to diverge away from the regional appointments. Um, having said that, uh, regional representation, functional bilingualism, diversity, um, diversity in particular are very important criteria and ensuring that we have qualified jurists that put their names forward so we can make the appointment based on a significant pool of candidates is the approach, is the policy that this government is moving forward with.